For centuries, the plains of South India were dominated by this fort. But by the middle of the 18th century, it wasn't held by Indians, nor by the Dutch, nor even by the English. It was in the hands of England's oldest and most tenacious rivals, the French. The struggle between the English and the Dutch had been primarily commercial. It was strictly business, a competition for market share. The conflict with the French was political. It would decide who would govern the world. It raged in every corner of the globe, even here in the ancient Indian fortress of Jinji. And its outcome was very far from a foregone conclusion. Today, the French system of education is one of the most centralized in the world. Everyone's taught the same syllabus, the same maths, the same literature, the same philosophy. It's an authentically imperial project, and that's as true here as anywhere else in the French-speaking world. The amazing thing is that this isn't Paris or even Perpignan, it's Pondicherry on the southeast coast of India. If things had gone differently in the 1750s, schools all over India would be like this. And French, not English, would be the modern world language. Pondicherry, one of the first French bases in India, was just down the coast from Fort St. George. But palaces like this look down on similar courtyards in Louisiana, Canada, and the Caribbean. Think of it as a race for empire. At first, Spain had made the running but the Spaniards had frittered away the loot from their conquests. Then the Dutch pulled ahead with their financial wizardry, but the Anglo-Dutch merger shared that advantage with bigger Britain. By 1700, there was only one serious rival left. And with an economy twice the size of Britain's, France was now the favorite to win the race. In the British press, there was mounting alarm. Every Briton ought to be acquainted with the ambitious views of France. Our trade, our liberties, our country, nay, all the rest of Europe, are in a continual danger of falling prey to the common enemy, the universal cormorant that would, if possible, swallow up the whole globe itself. Commercially, the French East India Company never posed much of a threat to the English. Despite massive government subsidies, it still managed to lose more than a third of its capital in just 20 years. Maybe that was because, unlike its English counterpart, it was under such firm government control. It was run by aristocrats, royal cronies, who didn't give a hoot about trade. What these men did care about was power politics. They dreamt of kicking out the British and turning India French. Anglo-French rivalry here and elsewhere led inevitably to war. The decisive conflict broke out in 1755. It lasted for seven long years. The Seven Years' War is one of those arcane conflicts beloved of a certain kind of dusty schoolmaster. You can almost imagine having to swat up the causes and consequences for some ghastly exam. Yet this 18th century Armageddon was every bit as much a world war as the great global conflicts of the 20th century. The fighting raged from Calcutta to Canada, from Manila to Madras. And what was at stake was nothing less than the future of empire itself. Would the world be British? Or would it, like Pondicherry, be French? The answer lay in Britain's shipyards. The Prime Minister William Pitt, the grandson of the East Indian interloper Thomas Pitt, ordered an enormous and expensive naval build-up. The Royal Dockyards became the largest industrial enterprise in the world. It was the first indication of the British ability to harness industry to the cause of empire. The Royal Navy doubled in size to a total of more than 300 ships. If you want a simple answer to the question, why Britain? It was the economy, stupid. 
The huge naval buildup was only possible because the British had something the French didn't have. Loads of money. Or rather, the ability to borrow it. The financial institutions copied from the Dutch at the time of King William now came into their own, allowing Pitt's government to spread the cost of war by selling low-interest bonds to the public. By comparison, the French were reduced to begging or stealing. So finance was the key. Behind every naval victory stood the national debt. The sheer number of British ships made a permanent blockade of France possible. By 1759, the Royal Navy was in a position to intercept and destroy the French battle fleet. But in truth, the French were sunk financially before a single cannon was fired at sea, because France was a bad credit risk. Like his Spanish ally, the French king was an absolute monarch with a reputation for not repaying his debts. So his government could only borrow at ruinous interest rates. This was the turning point for the French dream of global empire. Out in the French colonies, the effect of the naval blockade was devastating. With their supply lines cut, the French simply couldn't hold out. The capture of Quebec handed Canada to the British. The French sugar islands in the Caribbean fell too. And in 1762, their Spanish allies were bundled out of Cuba and the Philippines. That same year, the French surrendered the fort here at Jinji. By then, all their bases in India had been captured. The struggle for world mastery between Britain and France wasn't yet over. It would drag on with only a few intermissions until 1815. But the Seven Years' War decided one thing for sure. India would be British, not French. And that gave Britain what for 200 years would be the jewel in its imperial crown, a huge market for British trade and an apparently inexhaustible reservoir of military manpower. Indeed, India was more than a mere jewel. It was the whole diamond mine. <laughs> 